So I, it's like giving them an alternative narrative or discourse, and then you show them the value of that. And that has worked in some cases where people say, and we've done many of these studies for South African universities, where they say, well, now they understand that their ranking is not the most important thing, but on this set of 15 customized indicators, that tells me much more in great granularity what my institution does. So I'm, I, I think it's one of those problems where if people are locked into a certain discourse or narrative, no amount of logic is going to get them out of it. So I'm not sure that that's an answer, but that at least it, it speaks to a strategy of how you can work. Thank you very much, Johan. Uh, a good talk and a very uh, thought-provoking one. Um, I'd like to provoke something more, if I may. The, the way you disaggregated the PhD per 100,000 is very interesting uh, from the South African perspective. Of course, for the, what we call them, the more advanced economies, there is an ongoing concern with the PhD um, as an indicator of social mobility. And there are attempts made to try and track uh, how socioeconomic status comes through in the data. Now, if I return to the South African story, it would be very interesting indeed to look over the last 10 years how the socioeconomic standing status, family status of the two candidate groups actually gives you a slightly different version of the reality because we have an exceptionally dynamic class formation structure in the country. Uh, some people, of course, uh, labor under the mistaken idea there was no black middle class pre-1994, which is a nonsense. But post-94, it has expanded enormously rapidly. So there's that whole SES issue to be put into our construction of indicators. Second, of course, which you naturally are aware of, is the presence of foreign students in our uh, PhD pool. Uh, and among emerging, eco emerging economies, I think we're quite exceptional because anything in the order of a quarter of our PhD output is to foreign students. So you might perhaps like to comment or set up yet another report study. Thank you. Let me start with the second question. Um, uh, Michael is correct. One of the interesting dynamics over the last five, six years is that South African universities has become the destination of choice for many PhD students from the rest of Africa. And in fact, when I showed you the disaggregation by race, when I said black students, last year in 2015, 55% of those black students were not South African black students. They would come from Ghana, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Kenya, etc., because they, it's cheaper for them to come and study with us they don't pay, there's uh, agreements, there's certain subject protocols where they pay the same as South African students, so there's not a levy on them. But it's interesting, the vast majority of them are staff from African universities, which are also already in their, uh, their mid-30s. So they don't change the age fact, the age distribution. So this 42 years average age of graduation has been very stable over the last five, six, seven years. So, um, so the, the, the point about understanding the dynamics of knowledge doctorate production is what happens after the bachelor's degree because black students who do a bachelor's degree invariably do not have the fam family and other resources to continue study directly to a postgraduate course and that's why the biggest dropout happens between after bachelor's before the master's before the PhD for white students it's not the same so they go off and they have to they have to pay off a debt and they and so on so the you're quite right, of course, we have to track more clearly the, the impact of the growing black middle class and, they, and them stemming their, their children. Most of them are first generation university students. But so this, this dynamics is not, I don't think it's gonna change fundamentally. So our biggest problem is one, that one hand that uh, we have, unlike in some European countries, like in Norway or the Netherlands, you can have full-time scholarships even you know, you study a study grant to do your PhD for four or five years permanently in residence. We don't have those things for most of our students. I should say, by the way, um, 
that there are big field differences. I haven't pointed to that. If you, you, can, you, can, you can add to this explanation because students in the natural sciences have a different profile. They, their age of graduation is about 34, 35. Why? Because if, if you're in the natural sciences and you do laboratory work, first of all, you can't study part-time. You have to be in residence in the laboratory. And they also progress from the undergraduate to the masters to a PhD. They get more full-time scholarship. At the other extreme, a PhD in education, the average age of graduation is 51. That 42 is the average. But who are they? They're not scholars. These in the South African system, these are school principals who want to do a PhD for promotion purposes so they can get a better job in the provincial department of education. So our PhD cohort is only about 30, 40% for scientific or scholarly careers. The other 50, 60% are for advancement of our jobs. So again, all of these things you have to interpret. That doesn't really change the indicator that much at that level, but it, it tells you how difficult it is when you start to think of interventions and strategies to shift the system to become more inclusive, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you very much for a very interesting um, presentation. I have um, um, one short kind of addition to, to um, what you have mentioned, just to confirm the, the kind of uh, broader implications of, of this uh, kind of trend. And maybe some suggestion or idea for the question that um, uh, Ismail asked you. Uh, to give you an example from my part of the world, uh, I'll take an example of a country which you all know from the war, Serbia whose minister looked at the, the biometrics data and was not very happy because he saw that they are well behind the so-called enemy Croatia. So they, he decided to do something about it. So he said, let's uh, incentivize people to publish more in Rebel Times. And indeed, he managed to succeed. You know, they, Serbia suddenly in four, five years shot up. You know, kind of. And what was the consequence of that was that the, a lot of people that are working in areas which are very much locally oriented, architecture, construction, engineering, basically they all went upstream, kind of not doing any more contracts for the local industry, but trying to publish in the web of science, you know. So yes, he achieved scientific excellence. What was the price of that? That the system became much less locally relevant. You know, kind of. So there are you know, non-trivial costs to that. And, and there are implications for policy which have uh, uh, deeper implications. Now, what would be the way out? And thinking about the uh, Ismail's question, I think that the, the way out would be to think that um, the systems have, do not have, if I use economic speak, one production function, one aim. Because what they do, they assume, you know, that all systems contribute to the generation of global excellence. And they completely ignore that these systems also have to be locally relevant. And the way out of that would be first to recognize these structural differences, which you very nicely highlight. And so the, the, the basic work, I think, should be done before you embark on this kind of benchmarking exercises to understand that there are structural differences of science systems, and they have to have a several functions, several roles. So in South African system, it's not only scientific excellence, but it's also local relevance. And then you would judge that system, how it is good in terms of local relevance and, and scientific excellence. So in that case, we could get a different metric, which would be much more, as you rightly pointed out, context specific, but that would require a bit more work, but it would be much more exciting stage in which the whole scientific and indicator community could be embarked. And it's partly kind of, I blame us also for not doing enough preparatory work to show these structural differences in which these, uh, uh, you know, uh, one-sided metrics uh, uh, can give quite distorted results. Thank you. I appreciate that you made reference to the body of literature on program evaluation, which during the first two days in the sessions I attended was completely neglected. And in fact, realistic evaluation, which was introduced 25 years ago, places great emphasis on context. And although I agree with your point about context specific, one of the problems, 
and I have perceived that in several sessions, is that there is an illusion that by taking the country as the context, that the, the, the um, uh, world becomes context specific. And the country clearly is not the context, and I think, or at least it's not the only context that has to be taken into account, but the subnational realities are very important. So I think that one implication in terms of developing indicators is uh, taking into account this type of triad in terms of context, in plural, mechanisms, and outcomes. Thank you. Thank you for the, the first comment. I absolutely agree. I think that um, the, uh, uh, that is, in a certain sense, another form of reductionism if you think that there's only one solution or one production factor. And I think that um, perhaps I can give you another example where for some reason there is this, uh, this is homogenization at another level. So in our own universities, so we, we are encouraged to, uh, to, pu to pu pu publish in the web of science and then all the deans of all 10 faculties say, gave the same instructions, whether it was health sciences or the arts faculty, uh, that an incentive will be given, that the double the subsidy will give if you publish in the web of science. And then one dean went even further and said, uh, we will pay you double the subsidy if you pay um, in journals that have an impact factor of five or plus. And then all the other deans followed. So I wrote a letter to the DVC for research and I actually just put in two graphs. I went to the journal citation reports for that particular year. The top journals in sociology, the top journal, which was the annual review of sociology, had an impact factor of 4.8. So there would be no journal in sociology that you could publish, whereas in the field of, it was, uh, one of the, it was in cell science and molecular biology, the top journal had an impact factor of 19. And I said, what stupidity, that don't you understand the differences in, in citation behavior? Of course they don't, but this kind of behavior where you think there's one solution every time, there's one strategy. So at least now when we engage with universities, we kind of emphasize to the vice chancellors for research, don't think of a single strategy, a research strategy, and a single reward and incentive structure for the whole university. Make it at least faculty specific and college specific then you will get more legitimacy. And of course, the other thing is you will get more buy-in and ownership from the academics. They're not stupid. They know that these, some of these indicators don't apply to them. Then they resist or they decide not to play the game. So I absolutely agree. It, it makes our life a bit more complicated, but that's fine as because if we don't use the knowledge that we have about field differences and methodological differences, then we shouldn't even be in the game, I think. Uh, I th thank you for your point. Um, yeah, I. I actually, uh, a realist evaluation uh, a la Pawson and Tilly in the 19, early 1990s is what, what we teach for our students and they, but that's now at the program level and the, and the, and the imp important implication is that we have seen in the last 10, 15 years also in scientometric studies that people want to do program impact assessment, especially social imp impact assessment at the program level. So the other thing that I think that we don't emphasize enough in our evaluative bibliometrics is the levels of analysis issue. You don't do evaluative bibliometrics or cytometrics at the systems level at the same, in the same way as at the institution level or field level or program level. Now people have large research programs or, or chairs, research chairs, and they want to use indicators that were developed at a different level for program level. And then you have to look at program outcome, outcome program impact, program value for money, return on investment, that's a whole different world. And the people who've done the most work in that field are the program evaluators. We have to go to them to learn, like the realist and the utilization focused evaluation. I remember in 2005, if I'm not mistaken, in science and public policy was the first time I saw there was a special issue under Susan Cousins, where she brought in program evaluation and the use of logic models into research evaluation, only 10 years ago, a tradition that had been in existence for 50 years. Yeah, so we have to learn a bit from history as well. Thank you. Um, I do share your sentiment that one simple uh, indicator um, 
is not able to capture the nuances. And um, people join a PhD program for many reasons, and people quit the PhD program for many reasons. And um, for instance, um, I, I teach a graduate level course in um, library and, inf and information science. And um, the first question that you will ask my students is that, uh, why are you here? And most students um, give me answer that, oh, they could not find a better job, so, and they have a you know, degree in history or anthropology or linguistics, and they, um, they hope that this uh, Master of Science in Library Science uh, degree will help them land a better job. Um, so, and the, uh, in our college, um, the highest enrollment uh, occurred in um, shortly after 2010, um, and then declined uh, um, actually very sharply. Um, so you may wonder, so what happened? This may not be a good sign, you know, on the surface, you know, maybe something's wrong with it, but, but actually I think it's for the better because shortly after 2010, what ha happened is that two years ago, there's, there was the economic crisis. So many people could not find a job. So what they, what they did is to find a, a, a graduate uh, a degree to, to, to pursue. And now the, the, um, the employment, uh, employment rate in the US has dropped you know, within 5%, many people, once they graduate from college, they can't find a job. So there's no need for them to pursue an advanced degree. And also um, some, of my, uh, some of my cohorts uh, in, the, in the program, they, they say that um, they drop from the PhD program because not because the um, financial situation is of all pressures, it's because they find a better job uh, like in Google. And so they ended up in just having a master's degree instead of a PhD. Um, or like in some biology, um, biology programs, they did not see a future uh, as uh, you know, a PhD in biology. So that's why they ended up in having you know, like a, a master's degree in statistics. So you know, from, from, from the indicator's perspective, you know, retention rate or how many PhD um, graduates per you know, 1,000, 10,000 people, it may, not, it may not look good, but actually I think people did that for, you know, for better career development um, purpose. So I really like um, your conclusion that this is a very complex process and um, more, more work uh, needs to be done. Uh, not just purely from a quantitative uh, indicator metrics perspective, but uh, using um, sociology of science to complement many of the um, numbers. You want, if you want to answer, that's fine. I can wait for the question. But it's, it's a question that uh, is somehow related to this. Um, uh, well, those that know me need to, to know that I always look for the, the biggest perspective that we can have. And my question stems from uh, three different, uh, different routes. And I would like to hear you from a point of view, uh, from a philosophical point of view, and from a socioeconomic point of view, uh, both uh, because they might not reconcile each other, uh, with each other. And uh, so my question is thus, um, we are running uh, to, towards improving our metrics, uh, individually, uh, institutionally, Countrywide, um, everyone is aiming to be at the top of the ranking. Um, do we need to continue to increase these number of PhDs? I remember a, a paper that was uh, written uh, maybe last year or the year before saying that the uh, biochemistry system requires this army of PhD students to continue to make the system, the science system works. But once these students graduate from their PhD, the university system cannot absorb them. Uh, so do we really need to continue to increase this the number of PhD students that we are producing. 
the other hat that I have regarding this question, and it's a presentation that I did to our uh, principal of the university a couple of months ago, saying that our workload as faculty members over the past six years has increased by 50% in terms of the number of students that are enrolled, both at the graduate level and on the undergraduate level. And as you know, at the graduate level, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So an increase by 50% at that level is a direct increase of workload by 50%. Um, so from a socioeconomic point of view, if society cannot absorb all these PhD students and we're not capitalizing on this knowledge, uh, and you know this is a, a shameful economics question, I do apologize for it, is there an optimal number or proportion of PhD students we should have uh, in society? And it might not be the same answer from a philosophical point of view. So I would like to hear you on both these uh, subjects. Okay. I think the first one was more of a comment, so I'll go straight. It's related to Catherine. Let me take the easy one first, because I'm, I'm not a labor market specialist or a person who works on skills development or higher education. Employability, but I do think there's something. Th the relationship to indicators for me is the following: we know that indicators very often get a life of their own and they become reified. And now what happens is the old problem, and we know that for, for 50, 60 years, that indicators start to drive systems. It should be the other way around. So once you set targets in systems, then people think that they have to be achieve whatever the, the results. Now, in South Africa at the moment, two years ago, we released a national development plan for 2030. There's a target. By 2030, we should have 5,000 PhDs in a country pa that produce every year. So at some point, I asked someone in the Department of Science and Technology, how did you come up with this number? And they said, well, I'm not sure. Uh, we didn't do any calculations. We looked at a similar size system elsewhere in the world. I said, which one? They said, South Korea. I said, in what year? They said about 10 years ago. And that's when they were producing 5,000. So we thought that's a nice target. Now you see, that's a ridiculous story, if it's true. I don't know how apocryphal it is. But you could argue that, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure people have made these studies to say that in certain cases, uh, there was this great paper recently in Nature about the history of physics, a bibliometric paper that you would have seen, which shows that over the last 50 years of physics, that per capita production in physics have doubled per person. So the individual productivity across the world has gone up. I think what's happening is that these numbers are, are clearly changing the behavior. They're forcing people to chase these numbers, these chase these targets, these metrics. And that, to my mind, is all wrong. It cannot be. What you have to look at what are the underlying institutions and policies, and are they correct, and do they serve the interest of the populace and the community and the society? And then you define your indicators afterwards. You can't. The indicator cannot be the tail that, that wags the dog. That's, that's just stupid. Um, but I've seen so many examples of that. And it's usually an example of a, of, a, of a culture, a society, where indicators are seen as compliance devices. It's only about accountability. It's not about learning and improvement and stuff like that. So, so my first point is that, yeah, we have to be careful, especially with indicators where the indicators set a target deliberately or undeliberately. Sometimes, if you say in that example that I gave of the PhDs, now we see 228 per 100,000 in Germany. Should every country try to strive for that? Well, of course not, because the German economy, the German society is not the same as in Slovenia, Slovakia, whatever. So you have to adjust targets to what works for your country and society, and that is the, set, the whole set of other things. So I think that um, we have to be careful when indicators become to get a, a life of their own, and you cannot justify the underlying targets or values that you set. I think the other issue, I know my colleague Nico Klutu works on this all the time, how many PhDs is the required right number in the country? And obviously the people who work in labor economics, labor market, would tell you that it depends on the skills gaps. Do you, we need more engineers for this society, more doctors for this society, whatever. But I, I must say that 
at least in South Africa, we don't have the unemployability problem. I know in many countries, PhDs can't get jobs. In South Africa, only 2% of PhD students can't get jobs in the, in the first year. So we, can, we certainly can train. In the rest of Africa, they've set targets, NEPAT has set targets for 10,000 PhDs a year. So at least in Africa, there's no question in my mind, we need more PhDs, even only to serve the science system, never mind you know, the civil service or the rest of society. There will be a fringe event on the side about uh, participatory engagement 